you might find something else there. Find what you need there. find something else there. You'll find what you need there. Juliet sneaks out through the back door, the nurse close at her heels. Her shadow falls on Juliet, nearly scaring Juliet out of her wits. Once she recognizes the nurse at last, she falls relieved into her open arms. The good woman doesn't let the child she has raised for so long set off without support and remains at Juliet's side. Romeo stands waiting at the Abbey, and Juliet hurries to him. In God's name, they want to vow their eternal love to each other. The reunion turns into a celebration for both Romeo and Juliet. To the lovers, it's as if an eternity has gone by. Friar Lawrence can't help but smile at the young happiness before his old eyes. With new hope, he leads the couple to the altar. He turns two hearts and bodies into one as he gives the bridal couple his blessing. A sob brimming with happiness escapes the nurse thereby. The old woman presses the two to her bosom as if they were but one child to be protected.
Lawrence himself urges them to be careful not to let the ancient grudge destroy such young happiness. Yet the lovers join in a kiss, carefree, as if there were no tomorrow. Speaking of the morrow, do I see evening approaching? It's not that late yet. Those are merely thunderclouds. Rest easy and go on with the story. I'm begging your pardon, Miss Anne. For today I'd rather leave it at that, at the point where they're all happy. Where would it end otherwise? At a point which this love does not deserve. But why must it end there? That, Miss Anne, is what I gladly want to relate to you tomorrow. For tonight, their happiness shall be a pillow for us to rest upon. I won't be able to sleep on it if I don't know how the tale continues. I promise you, Miss Anne, I shall wait for you on the morrow, and with me the tale. Which means that you can go to bed in peace. Well, if you can wait that long, then I'll be patient too. Greetings to your father, and don't brood so much about the ending. I shan't brood if I can dream that a happy end is in sight. That dream you must look after well, even though a keen world wants to seize it from you. I shall, till tomorrow morning. Alas, if it were only tomorrow now, the loneliness of night. It's been tormenting me for days. How dearly I'd wish you could be with me. And, dearest, no sooner do I see my saviour's daughter who bears your name, the more I must think of you. She has our daughter's eyes, so alert and clear when she listens tensely to the storytelling. Alas, if you were to encounter small Anne, you would love her as you would a daughter. You, my Anne, I love you and am yours for all eternity. You're an early worm today, Miss Anne. But do come in. You simply couldn't wait, could you? Forgive me that I am not my niece, and for disturbing you so early in the morning. All I wanted to know is how my brother's guest is faring, and whether there is anything he lacks. Thanks to your brother, I don't lack a thing. Allow me to introduce myself. William Shakespeare, at your service. We are cousins in name, parted merely by rank. Lord William Stanley. It's a pleasure, I'm sure. And for me, an honor. What can I do for you? Do? For me? There's nothing you could. As for my brother, though, he is quite taken with you and the talent you refer to as theater. He is a connoisseur of my art like no other in this town. You're right about that. He positively lives for it which is surely better than dying for something else. What's your opinion, William? The art of the stage shall serve life at all times. Solely the art of warfare serves death, my lord. Yet when it serves the purposes of honor and heritage, it is worth fighting for, isn't it? I am not well versed in fighting. Believe me, I do understand you. The naked drawn sword, that is not your remit. Although words can be a far worse weapon. The words I write serve a purpose unto themselves, and the story being told, they surely have no other intention. Intended or not, watch your words, William, that the tongue which speaks them does not betray its holder. I have naught to betray other than myself and my dreams. Uncle William? My dear niece, what a great pleasure to see you. You may gladly keep your dreams to yourself, as long as you keep my words in mind. My thanks once again, my lord. I shall not forget them. Master Shakespeare has time for you now. I wish you lots of fun with his fairy tales. Fun that I shall have, Uncle William, though I don't need your wishes to do so. Miss Anne, so nice that you've come, and that the graveness of life departs once more with your uncle. I came as fast as I could. I didn't want to miss the story. Without you, it has no chance to continue either. Where had we left off? Where Juliet and Romeo were vowing their love before the altar. How lovely it would be if things ended there, and it all took a turn for the best. But no sooner. The sun next day cooks emotions to a boil, and Tybalt seethes with rage because Romeo escapes. Self-styled guardian of Juliet's honor, he's bent on punishment. Seeing Romeo, he draws his sword, the brute. As for Romeo, he recognizes Juliet's cousin and would avoid a fight. 
Always one to stand by a friend, Mercutio draws his sword. Romeo rushes between them, merely wanting to part the two. Beneath Romeo's arm, Tybalt thrusts towards Mercutio. He stabs him mid-chest, a mortal wound, and Mercutio sinks to the pavement. Romeo is beside himself and deals a bloody blow that takes Tybalt's life. He flees with the blood of a friend and a cousin sticking to his hands. As for the citizens of Verona, they denounce the bloodbath. Again, the dispute has besmirched the streets of their city. The Capulets are off to hunt down Romeo, demanding that his blood too shall flow. As for him, he'd flee both their revenge and his own deed. But the mob corners him in a narrow alley, where he desperately seeks a way out. Chased by bloodlust and plagued by his own conscience, 
Romeo can only escape the former. Yet he does not remain unscathed. A sharp branch bores into his side. Leaning against the wall to regain his breath, he ends up sinking, exhausted to the ground. Juliet learns of Romeo's flight and Tybalt's death from her nurse. The grief due to her cousin is outweighed only by her fear for Romeo's life. She must look for him, stand by him, with the nurse willing to help her. On the large plaza where Tybalt died and Mercutio too, Juliet's quest for a sign of life from her Romeo commences. something else there. Juliet discovers her Romeo in a narrow alleyway. He's running a fever and nigh on to delirious. She beds his head in her lap and dabs the sweat from his brow. Then she brings him to the Abbey to Friar Lawrence, the last safe haven. Having injured his hand, Lawrence needs Juliet's help to take care of Romeo's wounds. She is to prepare a tincture made of herbs in order to free her husband of his fever.
find what you need there. Take a look over there. 